Um, how do I move this thing? Let me make this smaller. Okay. Um, okay. So what are web browsers? Um, there's a lot of them. The main ones are like Chrome, Safari, Firefox, but there's also like Edge. Um, there's other ones that are like not that good, like Opera and stuff, but they're all like the same general purpose. Um, they're used in many different devices. So if you got a computer, you got a smartphone, uh, cars like Teslas and stuff also have them now. And like any sort of smart device probably has a web browser in it. So it's a good thing to know how to exploit because it's like everywhere. So any device you're trying to get persistence on, if you have a browser exploit, you're in a pretty good position to do that. Um, also, Daniel, if anyone says anything in the chat, can you like shout me out? Because I'm not gonna be able to see it. Yeah, of course, of course. <laughs> okay, cool, cool. Um, okay, cool. Uh, the attack surface for browsers. Um, there's a lot of attack surface. Um, there's like rendering engines um, that like render the HTML and the CSS and stuff on the page and the images. There are plugins. Most browsers have stuff. Chrome has plugins. Firefox, all of those. Um, but I don't really do that, so I'm not going to act like I know too much about those. But there's definitely a large scope of things you can attack. Um, the main thing that I do stuff with is uh, JavaScript engines. And those are the things that um, basically execute JavaScript code. Um, it's an engine, not an interpreter, because it does some sort of like just-in-time compilation and things like that, too. So most people just call it an engine. It has a large functionality. Um, the main ones that people know about are JavaScript core. That's the one that's used in WebKit, Safari. Um, they're using other things too now, but I forget which. Um, Firefox uses SpiderMonkey as its main JavaScript engine. It's the most simple one, and it's the smallest code base, I believe. So if you're trying to get into this, you might want to start with SpiderMonkey. Um, Edge uses Chakra core for now. Uh, there's talks about being discontinued pretty soon, but for now they use Chocolate Core. A few other devices with Edge use uh, WebKit now, so that's another thing. And then Chrome and Chromium use B8, which is probably the most complicated one from what I've looked at. It's a really large code base. It's like 40 gigabytes of source, so that's pretty intense. I almost tried to get cloned and I didn't, and that's why I'm doing WebKit because I don't have enough room on my computer for Chrome. But I'll be mainly focusing on uh, WebKit exploitation. And WebKit's the one that is very popular used for Apple devices like uh, Mac OS, iOS, uh, iPad OS, things like that. They all use WebKit. And other versions are used in Nintendo Switch and other sort of handheld consoles. Um, JavaScript Core is the uh, JavaScript engine for WebKit. And it's pretty complicated. So I'll be trying to give a little bit of an overview of how it works. Um, how, even though I'm only talking about WebKit in particular, most of the concepts should carry over anyway because they're all relatively st like similar. The objects are structured a little differently. The, uh, there's different names for stuff. Like VA has maps where JavaScript core would have um, structures and things like that. But the whole concept's generally similar. So if you know how to exploit one, and you like look at the source code, you can probably exploit the other ones too. And I'm on a MacBook, so I was like, web code would be cool because maybe I'll find something for Safari and be able to go with that. So it's pretty fun in that respect. And of course, iOS exploits often use WebKit because with an iPhone, they don't give you a shell like when you get a new iPhone. So WebKit's a good place to start breaking out into the sandboxes and trying to get root on an iPhone. I think that's probably the most common way to root an iPhone, if I'm not wrong. I feel like a lot of people start with WebKit more than anything else. Um, oh yeah, building WebKit's pretty easy. Um, if anyone's done building of large code bases before, I'm sure you know about stuff like CMake and Make and all of those things where you have to configure, make, install, all these different things. But WebKit kind of does most of it for you, which is nice. They have some nice little scripts inside that do it for you. Um, you'll want to install some stuff like uh, libicu dev, Python, the obvious ones. Ninja is one of the things that's used to build it, but Ninja is used for a few different things now. So you just get the source code on Git, and it's pretty easy to just Git clone it. You can also get it with Ninja, but I wouldn't recommend that. And then you install the dependencies, and then you run the script called build webkit. And whenever I do it, 
I just build the JSC because that's the JavaScript core. And when you run JavaScript core, if I have it open still, it's just basically the JavaScript engine of WebKit running in a console. So it's very nice and it's super easy to use, like just whatever you want. And it has a few built-ins too, which are nice, like the word describe. And that lets you see stuff about the object. So it'll say, oh, it's an array of N32s. It has an object in this pointer. The butterfly is pointing to here. There's the structure ID. So it's pretty convenient. And if you make a good exploit in JavaScript core, it should generally carry over to running on actual Safari or WebKit as well. Um, of course, if you're doing stuff like CTF like where you're like, oh, I'm just gonna find the global offset table and leak uh, libc pointer and do some subtracting and put that in and get one gadget. That won't really work because of the fact that there's all these libraries and everything's positioned differently, as well as a lot of threads. But like if you're just developing an exploit and you're making good primitives and doing it the right way, you can just do it in JavaScript core and it's a lot easier. And you could also do it if you wanted to in Safari. You could open Safari and then open console and then do it all from there. But that would kind of be gross in my opinion. I've tried that, I don't really like that. And then you just go into the WebKit release. You use the LD library path to use those libraries in there. And then you just run JavaScript for it. So it's very convenient. I found this from some guy, uh, MightyMo. He has a really good GitHub repo. This uh, browser pwn repo here has a lot of different browser resources, how to build all four of them, different real world CVEs, walkthroughs, CTF challenges. So if you're trying to get started with this stuff, I would highly recommend going to this GitHub link here. It's like definitely the best resource that I found in my opinion. Okay, so when you're building it, like here, I use the debug flag. However, would you want to build the debug build or would you want to just build WebKit? So when I build JavaScript core, um, I build both because I was testing both different, but the debug one is nice because it has debugging symbols. So it's like a non-stripped binary in that you can be like, oh, I want to print this address if I want to cast it to a JS object, for example. And I'm like, oh, okay, here's the structure ID, here's the butterfly pointer, here's the uh, different buffers and things like that as well. So it'll print it out super nice for you. Um, however, the debugging mode has, like most debugging modes, a bunch of stuff just stored randomly in memory. So if you ever access it out of bounds and change those values, it'll freak out and throw some assertions and basically just like quit on you. So if you're fuzzing, that's good. Because if you're fuzzing WebKit and you like, find an ASAN crash, you're like, okay, cool. I have some sort of a bug. And now if I'm trying to actually exploit it, I'll do it in a normal build so that it doesn't freak out on me. But um, like I could show you what it looks like here too. Cause I was like doing some stuff. If you look here, like all these bad beefs or whatever, that's just like stored everywhere in memory. And if any of these are changed from bad beef to something else before an object is created, it'll just freak out and be like, oh, uh, there's some memory corruption at this address because this is no longer bad beef. So that's another way to like tell. That's what you'll see everywhere. So normally when I'm doing the start of developing an exploit, I'll do it in the debug one until I start getting crashes and then I'll jump over to the normal one. And also the objects aren't too complicated. So I don't like, I feel like it's harder to print an object with like, print cast it as a pointer to JSC colon colon JS object address, whatever. I would rather just kind of look at it in memory, but like, I think this is the structure ID. I think this is this. And if you look at the source code, which is very nice like this, it'll have you everything you need. So there's a lot of constructors and stuff in here. You have enough in the source code. You don't need to use the debug build. Okay. The data representation in JavaScript core. Um, JavaScript, as anyone who's programmed in it knows, is not one where you choose the types of variables. So you won't say let uh, r equals new array of integers and then give it some integers. 
you'd be more like let r equal and then you just start throwing elements in there you can add anything you can be like let's make an integer and then a double and then a boolean and it'll just kind of let it happen so the problem with that is that when you're using javascript it has to know okay is this value a double is this an integer is this a pointer to an object so because of that the values that are stored in objects are usually boxed which is this awesome word here so boxed data gets um stored in a way such that there are a few higher order bits set so that it can look at those bits and identify okay this is an integer or okay this is a pointer or this is a double so that's the way that the boxed part works for this unboxed data happens too um it's easiest to tell with like doubles but um it's not as often as you'll see boxed data and that becomes a big issue when you're trying to exploit it because you can't just throw pointers in. It'll be like, oh, that's not a real pointer. That looks like a double because these bits are set and stuff like that. So that's how it identifies data types, for example. So this is a very nice comment that I found in the source code of JS um, value. So if you look in the JavaScript source code, it, it has this super well commented thing. This is the other good part about browsers is you have source, which is very nice if you do like any sort of exploitation. So yeah, the way that this explains it is that if you have a pointer, these four bit, these four um, nibbles are zero. If you have a double, these four nibbles are anything from 0001 to FFFE. And if you ever get an integer, it'll have FFFF as the top four bytes. And because of this, it, you can tell what the type of data is. And the JavaScript engine can also tell what type of data it is. And the other interesting thing about this is because the double starts at uh, whatever hex one, and then like whatever, six bytes of zeros. Um, whenever they create a double, it adds that value of one, or I guess, yeah, two to the 48 to that number to represent that, oh, this is in the double range. And you can't make doubles over size hef, hex FFFE because of the fact that when you add one, it becomes an integer and it freaks out and says, oh, you can't have that. That's not an integer, that's a double. So, and then there's like booleans and junk here. Like these are just set down here. They're not actually anything. It's just like a pointer, but this is too low a value to be a pointer. So box or unbox. This is a really outdated meme. It's a boxy meme, but whatever. Um, yeah, so I'll kind of show a little bit about how that stuff would work. So in order to do that, I'm going to do it in LLDB. And if anyone has ever used LLDB and has good tips, please let me know because it's so bad. It's so bad. But it's like GDB for a Mac, I guess, in a way. So when you run it, you just run. And then you can make an array. So I'll make an array called R and I'll just give it a few integers. One, two, three, four. And then because of the fact that this is a JSC as opposed to being WebKit, I can just do like, oh, let's describe it. It'll tell me, okay, it's an object. Here's the butterfly. Here's the structure and everything cool like that. So now in memory, if I look at the object, I'll see this stuff, which is like structure ID and flags and other things like that that I'm not gonna go into quite yet. And then this is the butterfly value right here. And I'll explain what the butterfly is too, but for now let's just think it points to the data. So yeah, here's the one, the two, the three, and the four. And you can see the hex FFFF up here because these are integers and it needs to recognize that these are integers. So I can also add another element that's an object, for example. And if I do that, and then break out again and look at it. Now here is something else. And this right here is the object pointer. So if you look at this, um, you can tell it's a pointer because if we go back here, go to the previous slide, you'll see the top four nibbles are zeros. So you can identify, okay, this is a pointer. And this right here is the object. And you can follow it if you want, look at that object. but. It's just another object and there's nothing going on with it. So it's not even interesting. So yeah, um, I guess the other thing I'd want to show really quick is um, let's make a 
DB for double array. Well, okay, DA for double array. And let's give it a few doubles. 1.1. 1 .1, just 1.1 1 .1 over again, because I like that. That sounds easy. So now, if you look at uh, what DA is, it is a array with double, because there's only double values stored in here so far. And if I break into the debugger and look at the values of the butterfly, they're all 3FF199999A. Nine, 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 and if you like do Python unpacking as a struct or whatever, you'll see that these are 1.1 stored as a float, whoever I triple E code. So now let me add something that's not a double. Let me add a object because that's a easy thing to add. Then if I go back again, you'll see that the values are different because now it's 3FF2 as opposed to 3FF1. And that's because these doubles are now stored in boxed form. So because of the fact that they're in boxed form, they have to add the one here to denote that this is the value here for the rest of these bits. So that's just another little thing you'll notice. Um, when you're doing JavaScript exploitation, you um, generally could just use someone else's libraries to fix those things for you. Um, Silo wrote a really good utils library that does the packing and unpacking from different forms using array views. And then he also wrote an interesting N64 library for storing and working with 64-bit integers because you can't really save those in JavaScript. So he does some interesting math and stuff to make that work because you just want to do it all in JavaScript. You don't want to have a JavaScript exploit where you have Python doing stuff and sending it back and forth to JavaScript because it's just in one file. You're just going to be running in one file. Okay. So, also, are there like any questions or anything yet? Anything that kind of like went over anyone's head? I don't know how to look at the chat. Is that chat right here? No, that's not the chat. I'm going back. Oh, this is for my Google thing. Okay, let me go back to here. Chat's in the options bar where you shared your screen. Dude, how do I get out of this? Do I make a new tab? Oh, okay. Chat's up here somewhere. Yeah, whatever. I'm going to close that. I think I closed it. Okay, good. Um, yeah, so the JS object is the next sort of data type that we'll be looking at. It's a little bit more complicated because the other one is literally just doubles, integers, pointers. It's not like an object. It's just a single thing. So these are JS objects in almost everything in JavaScript is some sort of inheritance from a JS object, whether it's like arrays, typed arrays, array buffers, they all link with JS objects in some way, for the most part. Correct me if I'm wrong, because like I've only been doing this for like a month or two now, but everything I've seen has been pointing to that. Um, yeah, the data is stored in a very abstract object called a JS object, and the main ones that I work with are typed arrays, because they're very good functionality. There's a lot you can do with them. So an object could be have an array elements like this, where you access it by bracket and then the index. And then it also has properties that are like a name. So you could like r dot a equals this, r dot um, something equals something. So these are properties as well that you can use to store data inside of an object. So you can have elements and properties and functions, but functions are just properties too. Um, the way that these are stored, this is where the butterfly gets its name from here. I got this from a Silas Frack article. He's a very good uh, researcher. I think he's in P0, but I'm not positive. And he wrote a few really good papers on this stuff that's good for new people. I'm, I put links at the end so you could see them. Um, so the way that this works is that the object's butterfly points right to this point here and it has a length value beforehand, and then the number of elements, and then it has the properties beforehand. So it's very interesting the way that it's stored. So if you look after in memory, you'll find the elements. If you look before, you'll find the properties, and the length is also stored here. So basically everything you'll need is pointed to by the butterfly if it's a standard sort of JS object, like a typed array, for example. Um, so that's like interesting. That'll come in handy. But it's called a butterfly because it has like both ends. The like the elements are the right wing, and then the properties are the left wing. So that's kind of cool, I guess. I don't know why they did that. Um, okay, this is where it gets a little bit more complicated, but still, I'll explain it all pretty well. 
so it'll make sense. And once you understand this, you're pretty much good. Um, there's a lot of other stuff that goes on with JS objects. And because of the fact that it's such an abstract data type, there needs to be a way to reference what it actually is. So that's where the JS cell comes in handy. And the JS cell has a few different values in it. It has the structure ID, which points to the structure object that I'll explain. And then it also has like a bit to explain, not a bit, it has like a byte that denotes what sort of JS object it is. So like, for example, this isn't true, but like hex FB, for example, could be a float 64 array. So if there's a specific byte set to hex FB, when you run any function on it, it'll recognize that's a float 64 array and it'll function as such when it looks at the elements and stuff like that. Um, there's a few other things stored in the JSL too, like a length for some other stuff, but the main thing is the structure ID and the uh, type. I think it's called M underscore type. So the structure ID points to an ID in something called the structure table. And that's where you get the like framework for your object. So like when you make something like before I had R dot A, when you type an element dot A, how does it recognize what dot A even means? Like which property is dot A? Where is it in reference to on the butterfly? How far down is it? Um, is it an element? Is it like a sort of function? What is this? Like what actually is this? That's where the structure comes in because it'll say the property and it'll say what the slot it is in. So it'll be like, oh, there's a property called foo and it's stored at the zeroth slot. So right when you find the butterfly, you go here and there it is. And then bar and then boz. And it stores the string name of the property and then the slot number as like a dictionary. So you really need a structure ID when you work with an object because otherwise it won't know anything. You could do like something dot foo. If there's no structure ID, it won't know what that means. It won't know what slot it is in. So it'll, it'll, it'll mean nothing at all. It'll, they couldn't care less. And then this also points to what sort of class it is because that's part of the JS cell. It was like, okay, it's an array. And because it's an array, it has these different methods and stuff as well. You could fake all of these objects, but generally this is what it looks like in memory as far as how it actually is functioning when you create an object in JavaScript. Um, it's probably a little confusing at first, but it's pretty normal if you think about it. You just have to look at how each thing is set up. Um, I can go into a quick example in the exploit that I was looking at. Um, it was also written by Silo, and he used a container to like do some interesting stuff. Um, yeah, I imported all this class too, so like it's N64 and all that cool stuff. So here, I'll explain all the other stuff too, but like just to kind of get an idea, the header is like the flags double array is this, and this is the structure ID here. This is the representation that it's a float array, no, double array. And these bytes all mean something too. And if you want to see what they mean, you could go to JS value. Let me close the find window. You can go to like JS value, I think. And it'll explain a little more about these things, but it's a pretty big source thing to read. But it's pretty simple. What I would really recommend doing instead is just going in with LLDD and making an object and then seeing what it actually looks like. So like if you made a float 64 array in like JavaScript, for example, or you went eight array. Can you make it you want anyway? Yeah, I think you can. So let's say we want to let a equal u int eight array of size twenty, maybe. I hope I did that right. Okay, a new one. I don't do JavaScript. Okay. Okay. B. We have B now. So if we describe B. It'll say it's an object. There's no butterfly yet because it doesn't have anything happening with it. That would make no sense. So let's say B zero equals uh, 
20. It's a U and A array, so I can only make stuff less than the byte. It's B1 value. And then let's also give it like an element to B dot A equals hex 1, 2, 3. And then B dot C equals hello. No, let me click at B dot B. I think that's kind of cool. So now, if I describe it, there's a structure here. It has a new structure ID because I changed some stuff. It's no longer whatever 305 was because that was just an empty uint array, size 20, zero elements in the butterfly. And now it has a butterfly too, so that's a good sign. The object's in the same place, but the butterfly moves around when you do things with this. So if I look at the object here, memory, I can see here's the butterfly. And here is the other junk. So 13A is, I believe, 314, if I'm not mistaken. Um, let me make another tab really quick to verify. Or I'll just go here and just run right. Yeah, 314 is that. So that's the structure ID is the first keyword of this. I find the first double word. I'll just do W instead. So 13A is that. And then here's the other stuff, 108.2500. I don't know exactly what that means, but for what it's worth, most of the time you'd be exploiting something like this. You would just copy and paste this value because this references everything you need to know about what a array for uint eights would be. So that's kind of the general stuff. And then when we look at the butterfly really quick, here it is all bad beef zeros, which is interesting because it inlined some of the properties. Yeah, hex 20 is here. Hex 10 is here. And then the, they were inlined into this actual thing. So there's 10, 20, and there's no other element. But when you don't have enough elements, it inlines and weird stuff. But if I look at the butterfly and then I step it back a little, you'll see that the one, two, three is stored here was an integer because of this FF, FF. And then you'll also see that this right here is a pointer. If you follow that pointer, you'll find out that it's pointing to, sorry for being not good. Okay, it pointing to this stuff. There's this other thing here. I think that might be the string, I might be wrong. Yeah, no, but all that matters JavaScript's really complicated. I shouldn't have made a string. That was a really bad idea because it's not stored as a char array like in C. It has a bunch of stuff going on. But this is a pointer, so it's an object. So that's how you can tell that the things are being stored behind the butterfly. And because there's no elements here, because they were all in line so far, we're just going to have a bunch of bad beeps. So basically, that's generally how structure IDs matter. Because if I didn't have a structure ID and I ran, B dot B, it wouldn't know to look at this element here. It would be like, oh, what does that even mean? So that's why the structure ID of 314 matters. And that's going to come in very important. Okay. Um, yo, Dan, is there any comments or anything yet? Uh, yes. Well, you have one from. Uh, How do I look at the comments? So the kid of. Oh, chat. Ukraine. Yeah, yeah. And he says, does anyone happen to have a JSC binary to play with for Linux? Yeah. Oh, pff, not me though. Yeah, um, you can build JSC, like I was saying here, if you wanted. Like, it's not too difficult to build. But another thing you could do is one of the, the example I'm going to be walking through is for a challenge called WebKid by a Silo, and it was part of 35C3. CTF. So if you go here to the repo for it, and I was like looking at some of the other stuff here. If you go to like actually, um, where was this? Um, I think that if you can actually, I'm being dumb. The website's still live. Web 35 c 3 is still live somehow. I don't know why. So if you go to 35 c 3 you can still download the challenge, which is kind of funny. I think it's this something. Oh, yeah, there's a whole JavaScript section. So, yeah, you can go here, and if you download this, I'm not going to clearly download it. It'll take you to, it'll unzip to this repo here. 
and this has a bunch of random junk in here, but it has the um, binary right here. So you can just download it from there and then you don't have to build it. It's a relatively small thing and it works well. So yeah, I would just recommend downloading that for example, and it would have the bug you need to like look at as well. So you don't have to build it. The source is insane. I wouldn't recommend like downloading it from source unless you want to like really do some work with it because look look at the source like this is just one of the folders runtime i didn't even open all the other ones like this thing was like 20 something gigs i downloaded this before i went to work one day and i came back and it was almost done so that's like what a lot of download time this is insane so yeah that's what i would recommend for that so yes um I mean, there's other challenges you could download too that have JSC. And if you want, I can just send you my JSC as well, but it might not run because it uses a lot of libraries and stuff. I could probably zip it up if I needed to. Hey, defund joins. He's gonna be a pwn guy now. Okay, so yeah, that's generally how the object works. Can I make this like kind of small? I'm sorry for being like a boomer. I don't, I never used Zoom before. I feel like I just clicked it. Oh, is that as small as I can make it? Okay, cool, I'll just put it over here. So, um, yeah, so that's how the objects generally work, is that it has an object, the header is called a cell, the cell points to the structure, and the cell also points to the different like types, so you know what sort of class it is. Okay, and you don't have to log in for 35C3 either. Because the CTF's over, you don't need to log in to get in. So you can probably grab it from there as well. Okay. So that's cool and all, but we haven't even looked at a bug yet. So that's where it gets interesting is once we actually find the bugs and then everything else actually matters. Because if you're exploiting a target, it really helps to know how it actually works. Dude, what do you mean it's not like a math professor? Saying that you that don't know how to use Zoom. Math professors don't know how to use any like Discord or whatever. So I have something going for me. Okay. Um, yeah, there's a lot of different types of JSC bugs or any JavaScript bugs for that matter. But a lot of them are just like off by ones because when you're working with a really large code base and if you're compiling it with something like C or C++, it's not really gonna catch all of your off by one errors. And even if it throws like a warning or something, you're often just gonna ignore it because like you're compiling a large code base and you don't wanna deal with it. So a lot of times when there are bugs, it's little things like that. But then there's a lot of other ones that are like typed confusion. I'd say the main sort of bugs I've ever worked with with browsers have been some sort of a typed confusion in a way. And then a lot of the bugs are due to the fact that there's some JIT mechanisms that do some sort of compilation and they get really finicky because they want it to run fast and sometimes they do dumb stuff for speed, which you'll see what I mean when I explain what JIT is. But a lot of the stuff comes because of the fact that JavaScript doesn't just run in an interpreter, it runs in a JIT compiler as well. And that creates a lot of weird issues. Um, fuzzing JavaScript is scary. Um, I once decided that I wanted to write a JavaScript fuzzer. I looked at the, uh, JavaScript syntax, like a reference that had all of the syntax, and I just thought I didn't want to write a JavaScript buzzer anymore. It didn't look fun at all. There's so much stuff in there. But somebody wrote one already called Fuzzy Lee. I think it was written by some of the people that work at Rex2, maybe, um, or Project Zero, I'm not positive, but someone worked on it that was either like Niklas or Itzen or Silo, and it's a very good library because it creates valid JavaScript code runs it through the interpreter, checks to see if it crashed or not, and then goes from there. So you don't really have to write a JavaScript fuzzer, you can just use theirs. And then you can also make it more specific to things that are things you wanna look into. So you can focus on having it be more about arrays or focus on JIT compiling certain functions and things like that. The other thing about finding bugs in JavaScript is that the code bases are open source for the most part, or everyone I've ever looked at. So like, you can do static code analysis, but like, like, do you really wanna do static code analysis on something that looks like this much functions? You probably do, but um, it's definitely better to start with like 
um, fuzzing it. And then after you fuzz it, you could jump in here to the function that crashed and see, okay, what looks weird about this? You don't need like Ida or Giger or anything. That helps a lot too, trust me. So, um, JIT. Oh my God. Okay, perfect. Um, JIT, or it stands for just in time, which means that it compiles while it's running. So when you're running a um, like browser or just the JavaScript engine, if you want to, it is compiling as it goes to make it more optimized. So for example, let's say that you have a function that adds two doubles and inside it adds like another double or something like that. If you JIT compile this function over and over and over again by like just running the function over and over again, it'll start to optimize it. So it'll start to recognize, hey, this is a double. This is a double. It adds the two doubles and returns a double. So it's like, okay, as long as this is um, this structure ID, we know that these two things are doubles. So if we know that both of these options are doubles because of the structure ID, we know that we don't have to check if they're doubles or not. We can just add them like they are and send them on their way. We don't have to check everything. And it makes it a lot faster if you can just not run all these checks whenever you run any functions. So it's really good in theory. And it notices if like the structure ID changes or if something happens where there's a new thing added that changes how it functions, it triggers something called a watch point where it says, hey, the structure is different. Your object isn't the same anymore. And when it hits the watch point, it's like, okay, cool. We're just gonna throw away all this compiled code because it doesn't matter anymore. We have to go back to doing the bare checks and seeing if it's doing exactly what we want it to. So without going into too much depth, because this is like a very confusing thing and generally it doesn't matter too much for exploitation. Once you hit a certain level, like DFG, you're good. But there's the LLint, the baseline, the DFG and the FTL. And those are different levels that happen. So for example, you run it a hundred times or so, you go to the LLint version. You run it like a thousand or like 10,000 times, you hit baseline. And then like once you hit like a few million times, you start hitting these DFG and FTL. So if you run a function over and over and over again, it gets super optimized because it takes away all these different redundancy checks. It's like, oh, we don't need this. We already know that's true. And FTL stands for faster than life. No, faster than light, so that's kind of cool, I guess. Um, you can disable JIT too. Like, there's JSC options where you can disable it, but, but I didn't, I never had a reason to do that because, like, I always want my exploits to work on Safari. And if you're doing it on Safari, you're not going to be able to just disable your JIT. Um, this screenshot's a bit misleading. This is uh, from B8 instead of from WebKit. B8 creates a nice little looking graph for you of how this thing is actually like compiled with the uh, just-in-time engine, which is called Turbolizer for B8. WebKit is as those other names. But the problem with JIT is that sometimes things that should affect the JIT don't actually trigger a watch point or don't make a change. So it doesn't know what you're sending it. So maybe there would be a bug where you're adding, you JIT compile the double function. You find a way to turn one of the objects from a double to an object without triggering the watch point or with changing the structure but not triggering the watch point somehow. And then it's like, oh, we're adding a double and double. But one of them is actually an object or I guess a pointer to an object. Then when it adds those and sends it back to you, you have some value that's whatever double you gave it added to a pointer. So by doing that, you can get info leaks or do interesting things like that because of the fact that you're not actually working with the sort of data you think you are. You're working with an object instead of a double or something like an integer instead of a pointer. Usually the pointers matter a lot because you're trying to get read and write. But. So that's the issue with JIT is that a lot of times it optimizes too much and it's no longer actually doing what you think it should be doing. Okay. So the example I'm going to be walking through is called WebKid. And it was made for 35C3, CTF, which is a really good one. It was before HXP took over, so I think it was a little better than the one that was this year. And it was a very good CTF, and they had a lot of JavaScript challenges. And that's one of the reasons I got into it was because I tried to look at this 
And I was like, I have no idea what's going on. But I don't really like to have no idea what's going on for exploitation problems. So I decided to learn a lot about this. So this is what it did, was it created this, um, I'm trying to do the chat. I'm not, it's not like Twitch, Twitch is a lot easier. Um, it creates this new function called try delete property quickly. So it does these things here as like inside of the source code and it's recompiled into jobs report. So what it looks at is um, it checks to see if there's a previous structure ID and if not, it returns because that means that's the first time you compiled this object. You didn't change it in any way. And then it checks that the thing that you added last is the property name that you're trying to send to this function. And if that is not true, it'll return again. And then what it'll do here is it'll change the property into the old structure by setting the structure to previous, like manually, like this. And this stuff has to do with the butterfly, but it doesn't really matter for what we're doing. Basically, it's saying that because they're changing the structure, you don't need the butterfly anymore. So it goes back a structure and returns. And the problem is when it does this set structure, it doesn't trigger any watch points. It just manually sets the structure. So the thing that's interesting about that is the bug is due to that. So does anyone in the chat think that they know what sort of exploit they could do if you can do something where you delete a property that's the most recently added property and then you have changed structure without triggering a watch point by any chance. Or at least like why, why that could be weird because you're not changing the jitted function. It could already be jitted and now it doesn't know that it's changed or not. Okay, I'm just gonna go on, wait, yes. Yes, you could. You could definitely get control over an object pointer. And that is exactly what will be happening. So what happens here, like I said, is that the delete quickly function deletes a property and it doesn't trigger the watch points. So the JIT doesn't realize that the structure was changed. So the JIT code is still there and it can be unsafely used. So now, you can switch objects and doubles in the structure, like change element dot a from being a double to an object, and the JIT compiled functions would not notice at all that that changed because it's still super highly optimized to be working with doubles or objects either way. So here's an interesting thing that I showed here. Um, why did I show this on this? Um, oh yeah, no, the structure ID is the JS object thing and then the butterfly. I think I meant to put this on the other side, but I made this on like two hours of sleep. And um, yeah, basically this also shows how it's laid out. Here's the butterfly elements. But now because of the fact that we're doing the JIT stuff differently, if these are pointers or doubles or whatever they are, they can be treated differently and the compiled code would not know any otherwise. It would be like, oh, that's probably still a object because it didn't trigger a watch point. So here's a simple POC for this. And this was written by the guy who wrote the challenge. Um, yeah, so let's create an object that has these doubles. And then you can change a property to be 42, for example. Just you need to make one property because it needs a property to delete. Then let's make a function that just returns the zeroth element of O. And then let's JIT compile this function by running it thousands of times. That's all that JIT compile does. I can show you the code. It does, it's gonna take a while to close. Oh yeah, the other problem is that because it's such a massive source directory, it makes my computer run really slow. I don't know if that's like a my problem or if that's like an actual thing, but like it's kind of triggering. Okay, let's look at poc.js. And most of this code isn't like actually part of the POC. That's just the like functions that are um, stuff. Here's where the actual exploit code begins is here. So yeah, if it runs for this many iterations, like one 
Is a million? No, it's 100,000. Yeah, that's all you need to reach DFG is 100,000. So basically, JIT compile just runs this program's function, um, whatever, 100,000 times. So when you do this here, where you call JIT compile helper, um, it'll make helper run so that's really highly optimized for whatever the structure ID is. For example, here, the structure is um, 123, for example. It could be anything. And then we'll delete o.property. So that goes away. However, the watch point isn't fired, and you're now on structure ID 122. So now, if you do anything with this, you're changing structure IDs, but because it has a watch point for structure ID 123 to change, it doesn't know what's going on. So you can change it to structure ID 124, for example, by adding a new element, and it'll be like, oh, 123 hasn't changed. Nobody's done anything with the object yet, so it's fine. And because of that, it'll keep running like it was compiled to run by returning O0 as a double. So now if O0 is actually an object and you return O0, it'll give you the address of that object. So that's a simple way of seeing what this bug does. Does that make sense at all? Why I would do that in this example? The whole like watch point structure ID thing is a little confusing, but basically whenever an object changes its structure ID, the watch point clicks, and then the JIT function says, oh, it's different now. So when you're changing from 122 to 124, nothing happened with ID 123. So there's no watch point hit ever. OK, so now you have a bug. So why didn't the object assignment change the watch point? Well, the thing was, when you do this here, by doing this object set structure, it's not setting the way that it should. In most functions that are in the JIT compiler that do things like this, every time that set structure is called, it does some other functionality where it calls the watch point manually. Set structure just changes it manually. This is like the lowest level way to do it. So normally it's called through another function, and the other function does the watch point trigger and makes sure that the garbage collection is done properly and other things. And then eventually it calls set structure. This time, the way that the person patched it is they're manually setting the structure like this. So there's, it's an unsafe way to do the coding. But because it's done at such a low level in this like JIT function, try to leave property quickly, it uh, calls it directly because that's what the other JIT functions do. It just should call something here saying to trigger to watch point two. It's very bad practice, but it happens more often than you think, surprisingly. Um, so we have this uh, type confusion between a double and an object, which is good. That's definitely a bug, and that's definitely like something that people that do CTFs and stuff would probably be able to take it and run with it pretty well. But the thing is, there's a lot of checks and way you can work with objects here. So it's not the easiest thing. So the one thing you want to do is develop these two primitives first using your bug, adder of and fake object. And these are where you kind of get all of your meat for your exploit started. So the adder of function is the address of. And what it does is it takes an object and returns its address to you as a double. And that was basically what I showed with that one um, POC code that I put on the screen. The fake object does something a little differently where it has an array of doubles, an array of objects. You just compile it to do that stuff with objects. And then you give it a double instead after you avoid the watch point, do the weird stuff. And then because of the fact that it's looking for doubles, it lets you assign a value to a, no, because it thinks it's an object, when you do the JIT thing, you can assign it a value as a double and it'll put it at an object pointer because it'll still be rendering it as an object. It's like the exact opposite of what the other one was. So <coughs> here's the functions that they did to set up the address of. It's basically the exact same thing that I showed now. You make a function property, you delete it, you JIT compile the helper function to return the first element, put an object in it, return it. And then he, you could use like silos in 64 library to make it like look good and be something you can actually work with to by converting it from a double to an integer. Fake object does something where you have the row doubles 
you set the property, you JIT compile it by setting it over and over again as opposed to reading it. You JIT compile it, you set O0 to be an object, and then when you return helper dot as double, you return O0, you have this object that you created that's a pointer to a fake object because it's a pointer to an address and you like assigned that address to O0, but now O0 is an object. So there's an object here, you give it a double value, you have an object that you, you choose what the pointer is. You, you like give it a double value and now it's pointing wherever you want it to. So you're creating a fake object anywhere in memory by using this. So I can also demonstrate that because of the fact that JSC has something very nice, <coughs> or at least I think it's like pretty nice, where you can do, um, um, I'll do LLDB just in case you something cool with it. I probably won't, but you, then you could run it here with the POC.js, which has the functions adder of, so I'll set up fake object instead of adder of. And then if you do dash I, it'll drop you into an interactive window when you're done, which is pretty convenient. So let me make a object called R and I'll make it just an empty object. I'll give it a thing called r.a equals, hmm, I'll make it a string, why not? Wow, that's kind of, kind of cool. So now we have an object that has property a and it has whatever um, structure ID and stuff for that. So structure ID is 353 or whatever. But now if I call adder, I'll make the value, let adder of equal set up adder of, and then let's let fake object equals set up fake object. I'm hoping that it's right. Um, so now we have these two functions. So adder of r, it'll return this which is an address. And if you describe R like we did, you can see that that actually is the address of R. So now let's say, okay, cool. We have this address, but we want to create a fake object at this address. We'll call this, um, we'll call it hack because it's like a hack object. I don't know. So now we have this hack by creating an object at this point. There already is an object, so we know that it's real, but we created this fake object that's overlapping this. So now if we ask this hack, dot a, it'll print, wow, that's kind of cool, I guess. So while it doesn't look like memory corruption or anything, because there's not like a crash or a seg fault and we don't have EIP or anything cool, we have the ability to convert any address to an object, which is massive. And we also have adder of for any info leaks, which is also massive. So these are like big things that you always want to start with when developing a browser exploit is you want to be able to start with fake object and adder of. <coughs> and once you have these primitives, you don't even use the bug again. You just use these two primitives. So anything from here on out, if you can almost copy and paste any WebKit exploit from the point where you have the two primitives and you're good. So that's another very convenient thing is that it's a like universal to start with fake object, address of, and then you could use those two functions to like do the rest of it in any way. So now, we can make an object, we can do type confusion, but we don't have the ability to write or read to any address yet, which is, is, is the end goal for sure. Anytime you're doing an exploit, you wanna be able to write anywhere and read from anywhere. So now that we know that we have these fake objects and info leaks, we know how objects are structured. Like the weird diagram I showed before that had the butterfly, the backing pointers and stuff like that. We can create a fake object anywhere we want. We can create it inside of an array, for example. We could have an array of values and just put any data we want there and then make a fake object out of it. So the thing here is, could we use these fake objects to point to other memory or other objects by using butterflies, backing pointers, things like that? So I'm going to start by showing the way that I learned how to do it a while ago. And then I'll show a little bit about why that doesn't work anymore and then the little things you can do that make it work still. So it's not like an outdated method. It's like 2018 or something, but I guess in terms of exploitation, that is kind of outdated, I guess. So the classic way, 
it's like this typed arrays which are like the things I was talking about where you have like a float 64 array. Let's say you wanted to fake a float 64 array in memory. You give the value for the JSL, you give a value for butterfly vector length mode. But let's say that you also want to make the value for like vector is back in store. It's just silo called it vector. Um, let's say you want to make the backing pointer points to anything you want. So let's say we'll point it to a U int eight array in memory. You might as well. Um, a U int eight array is great because you could write a byte at a time. So that's another big plus there. So let's say that you have a float 64 array and you want to set the backing pointer to a U int eight array. By doing this, you can choose the values of um, vector and then you can assign it into it. So for example, if you're looking at this as like a float array pointing into here, you could set the second keyword, 0, 1, 2, or no, 0, 1, 2, which is the vector pointer to any address in memory by using your fake float array. And then you could set anything by doing like whatever u int eight array bracket 0 equals cc, for example. If vector is pointing to address hex dead beef, you're going to write a cc into hex dead beef. The reason why you can't just arbitrarily write with vector here is because of the fact that you're going to be making your float 64 array inside of some sort of other object, like an array, for example. So you can't just arbitrarily put pointers here because you need it to be a JS value. You can't just give it a double value because it'll write it in as a double. Or if you give it a int, it'll write as an int, the way I was saying how it does the boxing. But you can make it points to another array. And if it's pointing to another array, you can choose all these values however you want to do it with your uint eight array. So that's the thing that makes it pretty interesting. And I'll be showing a little about how that works too. Um, is there anyone like confused or anyone like kind of understands, but it's like has a little bit off or like has a question that they want to ask? Um, float 64 array values are um, boxed, surprisingly, I believe, because it's a, wait, let me think about that. No, um, float 64 arrays are unboxed. They are unboxed, you are correct. But the thing is that it's a fake float 64 array inside of another object. So whenever you're doing the fake, fake float 64 array here, if you're looking at the vector, for example, you're going to be able to write unboxed here, but these elements that are stored here inside of another object will be boxed. So that's the issue that you'll run into. But I want to say that it's unboxed. It's really hard to tell, for example. But the thing with float arrays is if it's boxed or unboxed is that you can still add or subtract 1,000. And the other problem with float arrays and stuff is that you still can't write 64-bit integers because of the fact that it still has the zero, zero, zero values and stuff. Awesome, see you around, Scotty. Thank you so much for sticking around so far. So now I'll show you here where it actually gets like interesting. The thing with the uh, float 64 array values is that when you're gonna create the array, you can just make a object like a container like this. And it's very easy to set it up like this. So you'll have the uh, JS cell header, the butterfly, the vector, and the length and flags. And you can just set these values in a container and it'll just make your object for you exactly like you want it to be. So by doing a struct like this, you're able to assign JS cell header. And here's all the like things in the JS cell, like I was saying. Here's a structure ID, the indexing type, which doesn't really matter. The M type for a float 64 array is hex 27. You can find that in the source code, but I forget where exactly. And then whatever flags and stuff. Um, he probably just copied and pasted this from like this or wherever, something similar to this. So it's not like too deep, but how do you go back? Okay, yeah. So when you do this, you create your header and this is eight bytes, butterfly, it doesn't matter yet because we're not going to use the butterfly. We're going to use the vector because it's easier to work with. We'll set vector to be hacks though. 
And what hacks is, is it's a uint8 array in memory. So you're going to have this array of all of these different bytes. And the start of the actual data bytes, like the stuff that's going to be the actual data, is going to be set by this vector hex. So it'll be pointing to this data in the uint8 array of whatever you want. And then the length and flags is going to be just this length here. It doesn't matter. He just copied and pasted this too, I'm sure. So what you're going to do is you're going to create the float64 array by getting the address of container and adding 16 to it. Because like I showed here, when you create a array, like the uint8 array and stuff, you get this value and this value. And then from the next 16 bytes is where the actual data and stuff is. So when you get the array value here, you want to add hex 10 to reach your actual data. And then you're going to create a fake object there inside of the contents of the float64 array. And that's where you're going to create your fake array, which is the fake float64 array that you created with your container here. So then um, find the correct structure ID. This right here just checks if the structure ID is correct. You can run instance of, and then it'll check the structure ID to be like, oh, does this point to a float64 array? And if it doesn't, you know you guessed badly. So that's another way of just brute forcing if I've hit a real float64 array or not. But generally, if you do the spraying, it should work on the first try. So then the container JSL header, you set that here again to whatever the next header is by adding each of the JSLs to get a good structure ID. And this is also from the frack article by Silo. I got a grand majority of this from his article. I read it a while ago, but I checked it again recently and it's still really good. Um, yeah, the, if you want to see why it works, you can look at jsobject.h and it'll say why all the structures and things. But like what I was saying, just make a float64 array in memory and then you can know exactly what stuff you should see and where. Okay, so. The structure IDs are the parts that point to what actually happens, like what sort of array and stuff it is. But how do you know what the structure ID is? Because that could be a problem. One way is info leaks. If you have an info leak, you can print your own structure ID and be like, oh, OK, I'm structure ID 520. So I'll just assign this thing is to be 520. What is adder of container actually pointing to? Um, Adder of container is pointing to the object container. So the object container would be like, I'll actually show you memory really quick. Let me make this code myself. Bar container equals um, whatever. I'll just give it names. Uh, A equals um, some value. Um, Oh yeah, no, I'm so bad at JavaScript. A, O X one two three four five six seven. Why not? Um, oh man, I'm so bad at JavaScript. <laughs> you can't do tab, which is the part that's really triggered me because I love hitting tab. Okay, is it commas? It is commas. <laughs> Dude, I don't do very many. Okay, let's say B is gonna be. What is B? Okay, false. It doesn't matter. We can just call it false actually, because yeah, that's a boolean. Um. We'll give C a value of an object. So I'm just going to call it that. Why not? And then D is going to be just another uh, thing. Let's call it 1, 2, 4, 5, 6, 7. So then we have this container. So the adder of container will point to this. And if we run a describe container, it'll say that the address is that as well. So let's look at that in memory really quick. And keep in mind, everything's gonna be boxed really badly because I just like threw these numbers together. The way that they do it here is like um, encode as JS val and other like stuff in the utils library. Yeah, JavaScript's a bad language for sure. I don't know who created this thing, but um, yeah. So here you'll see it like you have an object type and the object type is a non-array. That's what you get when you create a container. I forgot the word for it, but it's a non-array. And um, if you add hex 16 to it, and hex 10 you get here, here's the values. So the first one, second one is the false is six. And you can see that 
also from like way, way, way back here, like false is just a value of six because six is too low to be a pointer anyway. Um, yeah, and then the next object is C, so this is the pointer to that, and then D is this junk here. So basically, it's just like skips the header. So when you run add row, if you're going to get inside of the actual header of the container, adding 16 to it gets you into your fake container. When do the properties get put into the butterfly pointer? That would only happen if it's an array-like object. So the problem with the container is that it's going to make it not an array. And because it's not an array, there's no elements in the um, there's no elements in the LM thing. So the problem is a container or another non-array doesn't have any of these elements. So it'll inline the properties instead. If you have more than like, I think it's eight properties, it will make a butterfly for it from what I saw. But for something that's like only four properties, it shouldn't, in, it should just inline it. So the problem is like, if it had elements, if it was declared as an array, even an empty array, and they just gave it four properties, but it was an array, it would still technically use the butterfly because of the fact that there's these. Where are those properties? What do you mean? The ones like here? For the container that I made? The names I referenced in the container are um, being stored here. So like if I continue and I do container.a, it'll give me the value. The names themselves, like the actual names, are being stored in the structure, and its structure ID is 16B. So if you go to the structure table, go to the element 16B in the structure table, it'll have a dictionary that has strings and then indexes. So there'll be a string pointing to A, and then it'll have the index of zero because it's the zeroth index in the container. Structure IDs are dynamically allocated. So if I go back here and like continue and do like container.e equals uh, lol, why not? And then I describe container, the structure ID changed to 364. So it only works for a literal exact thing of names to objects. You can't change the structure ID at all. So like if you have a structure ID 363, it has to have A, B, C, D, and it has to have these types of values for A, B, C, D. Anytime you change a type, or you add a structure, or you delete one, it should change the structure ID. So that's like why that changes so quickly. I don't have a good way of finding the structure ID table in uh, LLDB, but um, I'm sure there'd be a way you could find that. I'm positive that that's a thing. So what was the thing with the inlining? Yeah. The values are being inlined into the JS. Does the type of a property change the structure ID? I think it should. That would make sense. So now let's say container.e equals one, two, three, four. Oh, it doesn't change the structure ID. It triggers the watch point though. But because of the fact that it doesn't change the structure ID, because it still has the name and the index. Yes. I'm getting structures and watch points confused. The thing is the property names and the slots are all that's stored in a structure. So because of the fact that it has the same slot and the same property, the structure ID shouldn't change. You helped me on that one, yeah. Um, it would still trigger a watch point because anytime you do anything that um, changes a data type, it should check it when it starts to run a JIT function. But because of the fact that it's in the same location, the structure ID should not change. So the butterfly is to avoid changing structure IDs a lot. No, the thing is that the so big. So it would only get down to like here, I think, because of the fact that it wants to not be too large. So there's a whole memory region that's just to hold values. And that's where the butterfly will point to. And if, um, if the butterfly can't fit in that location, it can reallocate and mem copy it all and then add new things if it needs to but it doesn't want to do that to the actual object itself. So let me add a few more properties. Container.f, container.g, and h. I think that should be still maybe in line, but we can find out. So yeah, 
no, it takes these four elements here and now it has a butterfly. So if you look at the butterfly now, and then you subtract maybe hex 30, you'll see that it has these values in here now. So the thing is that you're only gonna be able to store so much. I knew it was eight, it's only eight D words. It can store four Q words in line and then anything from that point forward will go into the butterfly because of the fact that this is supposed to be kept small. This isn't gonna be dynamically changing and if it becomes too large, and has to move around in memory, it doesn't want to move the full object because the pointers are to this object. So the butterfly allows you to mem copy and reallocate and stuff in the memory for the elements, but it won't actually move the object at all. So that's why the butterfly exists. Does that make sense, Grant? Cool, cool, cool. So where was I? Okay, so now we have the thing where because of the fact that we, um, okay, yeah, the structure IDs, you can just spray them. So the way that most people do it where you make sure to match a structure ID is that you just create a function that just straight up sprays structures and then it finds one to match. So for example, for the um, WebKit exploit that I was working on, if you look at pwn.js, which is, classic thing for a JavaScript phone. You'll see that, um, I scrolled too far, you'll see that. Um, yeah, so for here, what happens is he creates a hex 1000 structures that are all arrays of one element, and then gives it the pointer element because that's an element that he actually ends up using later on, but then also gives it an array element that's like a different name each time. So it's like prop zero, prop one, prop two, and it gives that to the new array. So by doing this, and he pushes them all to avoid garbage collection. If you create it and it goes out of scope and it's never touched again, it will like not work out very well for you. So that's the way that you can also predict structure IDs is because when you're actually running, you don't know which functions create objects. There could be like hex 200 objects or so, or maybe less than that, like hex 100 objects before you even reach this point of your exploit. So by spraying a thousand objects and jumping to object hex 800, for example, more likely than not, you're hitting something that has a valid structure ID, is a float array, and has these properties. And you just wouldn't use prop i because you don't know what it is. But by doing this, you make sure to get new structure IDs each time you run this loop right here. So that's why that works well here. So that's a way to get the um, structure IDs to overlap if you don't have like an info loop. And I'll explain why that's kind of funny now. So yeah, here's the thing here. I just showed what a structure ID is, 62. My thing had it too. Um, and these are all in line because it's an array. And I'm all out of line. They're all stored in a butterfly. Okay, so now, we have an arbitrary read write, and I'll show it more after I finish the uh, thing. I have a demo where I'll actually walk through the code and show you how it works for the actual example I did. But like for what we did here, like we created a fake um, uint array. We have our, we have control over the vector. We can point it anywhere in memory. So we have an arbitrary read write because we can point it write bytes. We could point it read bytes. Anything we need to do with that. So how do we get code execution from an arbitrary read write with a browser exploit? Because it's not like there's a functions and stuff that have like pointers and the heap and things. If it was a CTF, for example, you could probably look around your memory area and find leaks like heap leaks, stack leaks, high leaks maybe, and then override the global offset table with like one gadget, for example, and bam. But in reality, the whole context is very confusing because of all the threads, everything that WebKit does, everything that happens when you're running a Safari binary. So you don't want to really do that usually because the leaks are very unreliable. And if it's a slightly different version, the whole global loss of table would be different, for example. So the main thing is because of the fact that it's WebKit and it has to be fast, it allocates 
read, write, execute memory chunks, and you can do stuff with these, and that's very convenient. Um, the main way that it works is that if you make jitted code, you make a function in jitted memory, you'll often get a read, write, execute region by the jitted code. Um, the other way is if you create a WASM instance, you can create a read, write, execute WASM um, memory region as well. And the thing is, it doesn't matter what your WASM does or what your jitted code is. You can just copy your own shell code in there by um, whatever stuff you're doing with your arbitrary read writes. And then you can just run it like, oh, I want to call the WASM function, but now it's your shell code, so you can do whatever you want. WASM is the future of assembly. Okay. Modern mitigations. Um, it sounds so simple. And when I say simple, I don't mean like, it's definitely confusing and there are a lot of steps, but it seems like a clean and defined path from point A to point B. Like if you have an address of, you can create these arrays. If you create these arrays, you can create a fit function pointer. You can create read, write, X, get your stuff. So even though it's kind of difficult and a lot of steps, there's like a game plan. But they made it harder because they don't want people exploiting JavaScript for it, which I don't know why. I think it's a good idea. So the two main things that they introduced for JavaScript core, and they have different mitigations for each browser, but these are the ones that I've had to actually like encounter and work with. Structure ID randomization, which sucks, and something called the giga cage, which also is kind of sucks. Okay, so structure ID randomization. Um, now, something that they do is instead of making your structures go sequentially, they just pick a random number and that's your structure ID and they store it randomly in the table. So that doesn't, that's not good. Like you'll see the meme, Matt, don't spoil it. Um, so yeah, now they're not just sequential numbers in the uh, structure table. You can't know, okay, I created hex a thousand objects, hex 800 must be one of these. You don't know that anymore because they randomize the numbers. So, the solution is that not all functions that you call with objects require your structure ID. Reading and writing require your structure ID, but there are a few weird things that don't, and I don't know why. But one of them is function prototype to string call. Doesn't require structure ID. There's a few of them that like researchers have found. There's a lot of resources about this. So what you can do is create a fake object. No valid ID, we don't know what it is, and it points to a function executable as opposed to pointing to another array. And this function executable links to an unlinked function executable that's called for the prototype functions. And then down here, they have the identifier pointer that's the uh, identifier for the function and then the is built in is not zero, so it'll call this. And because of this, you can leak the JS cell of your initial thing by calling the to string on this JS cell for a normal object. And bam, you have this object's JS cell, which concludes its um, structure ID. So this is a way that you can do it. And while this kind of looks confusing because you have to fake a bunch of different objects, you can just copy someone else's objects from their exploit code. Everyone makes containers and stuff. So once you get to this point, <coughs> It um, isn't that bad because like once you have an adder of and fake object, like I was saying before, you still just have these things here. So you can create this fake function identified by this object and it will call its butterfly leak its JS cell. That's one good way to do it. Dude, I don't have coronavirus. I got, a, I got an issue called I talked too much and I haven't drank enough water today. It's basically the same thing. But yeah, these are found by uh, Insu Yun and Wenzu. They are from SS Lab. They're very smart, but they wrote a really good research paper on this, and I learned a lot from that. So I feel like I should call them out for that. Next is the Giga Cage. Um, so the Giga Cage is a way in which JSC only allows certain heap regions for the backing pointer of data. So it creates a special MMAP region. And this is the only region in which you're allowed to store your data. So you can't just point it into another object because it's like this is stored in a different region. 
this is stored where the objects are stored, not where the data is stored. So it'll actually throw an assertion and quit, or it'll fail a check and throw an assertion. So you can't just point your typed array to a uint array anymore because there's this giga cage and it's not in the gig cage. So it won't work. That's so hard to say. Butterflies aren't checked though. So if you have an object with a butterfly pointer and you have like elements and you know where they should be in line for your butterfly, you could just point your butterfly pointer instead at, and that the uh, whatever object in the butterfly pointer will be pointing to memory and then you subtract hex 10 for example to go to the b element and they could just run and set stuff with dot b and stuff like that instead so it's kind of annoying because the butterfly pointer you have to have a more reliable structure id you have to know what the elements are and you have to know where they are in memory but um it works the um the other one is wasm memory buffers aren't put in the giga cage so you could create a wasm object and by creating a fake wasm object, you could also set and delete wasm code by pointing to the um, whatever backing store of the wasm object instead. And it won't fail the giga cage check on that one either. So like, that's another one. Come on, Matt, you knew I had to do that. So that's like how you bypass the giga cage. Um, it sounds easy, but butterflies are harder to work with and a little less reliable. So it's definitely better, in my opinion, to use the backing store if you can, because the backing store is just a straight up array of data. The butterfly has backwards and forwards and elements in different places. So, but it works for bypassing this giga cage. Um, I've seen both methods used in like real people's exploits. Um, I saw Nicholas B use this butterfly one. That's where I found it. Um, someone called Linus Hens used this Wasm one instead when he was doing a. Uh, regex exploit um anyone who saw the live overflow series saw that he was doing the regex one by linus and when he got to this part of the exploit where he was actually reading and writing he did it through some wasm buffer instead which i found pretty interesting i didn't know that would work okay demo time how are you supposed to say wasm like is there another way to say it is it wasm is it actually wasm i'm gonna feel so sad if it's wasm I'll Google afterwards. I'm gonna keep saying Wasm though, because I like it. Wasm feels, it slips off the tongue well. Okay, so here is pwn.js. Um, first, I'm gonna kind of walk through the code and explain what it does. Um, this is different than the one, I was, most of the code snippets and stuff I was showing were from a older exploit. This one's a little bit newer, but I can explain what it does because it's pretty simple. Um, all that stuff is just like objects and stuff to make it easier to do uh, computations and things. They don't matter too much. So the adder of and the fake object, I already explained in the beginning. So you create those two things and, okay, yeah, this is pretty quick. Um, spray your structs, because this was made before the structs were a thing. This was like, what, 20, well, when was this? 35C3 was 29, late 2018. and the structs weren't randomized yet. So that shows how recent some of these mitigations are. So it sprays a bunch of structs and then it creates this container, which is the fake one stored inside of this structs array. It's one of these array values. And that's where you're going to be using as your victim butterfly. So it's going to get set up the container head to be this. So the structure ID is. 1000, which is the highest value of here, but there's guaranteed to be structures beforehand. You're not going to reach this point of your code without having an object made. So that's why it's like a good bet there. Um, and because this is newer, they're setting the butterfly to victim instead of the backing store. So that's kind of interesting. Then what you're going to do is use the address of the container and add 10 again to get to your fake object. And the original butterfly is going to be at hex one, which is this victim here. So then what happens is I'll look, explain one or two of these primitives. Most of them are pretty much the same thing, just for different amounts of data. So for example, writing two bytes is pretty simple here. You set hex one 
to be the address plus 10 because of the fact that it's a butterfly and you're going to be going backwards to access the properties. And then you're going to set victim dot pointer and victim is the butterfly like we showed here. And dot pointer is 10 values back from its butterfly. So that should be because of the fact that your sprayed thing here creates these structs that have an array dot pointer value and the pointer value is stored up back those many bytes. So you're gonna set that value as a double to hex one, and you're gonna and you're gonna. This is basically just setting up the um, butterfly for hex one, and then you're gonna give the value to try and write to the address by using victim dot point. So it's gonna corrupt the other six bytes because this right here is a double array, and by working with a double array, you're writing doubles. Um, for the reading functionality here, what it does is it still sets the butterfly as 10 past what you're trying to write to because you're going to be going backwards a little to access the element. And then you're just going to return the address of victim.pointer because of the fact that victim.pointer is the um, pointing to that value in memory. So if you read the address of that, you'll be reading that value from memory because it's being set as the pointer. Um, does that make sense? at all? Wasm. Is it actually Wasm? I'm going to be so mad if it's Wasm. There's no way. One sum. Yeah, Wasm? Oh no, that's sum. I'm dumb, yeah. No, yeah. Oh, Wasm. The Wasm's, yeah, it's definitely Wasm. It's got to be Wasm. So basically, this is basically the same thing as the one I explained before, but instead of setting the backing pointer to be pointing to the object, you're setting the butterfly to be 10 past what you're trying to write to and accessing the butterfly element as the property and using that to read or write. So does that make sense to like anyone who's made it this far so far? It's a little bit confusing, but that's because this is made when the giga cage was around. You know, I'm actually gonna click this now. I gotta know. Does it work? Oh, it did click it. Wasm. It is Wasm. I'm mad. It shouldn't be Wasm. It should be Wasm. I don't even want to know what it says about GIF like, or GIF or whatever. It's probably wrong, but I'll believe Wasm. I'll start saying Wasm if I remember for like a minute or two, and then I'll say Wasm again because I'll forget. Okay. So that's how these read write primitives work. It's basically just using the butterfly, like I was saying. So now you get to read write primitives. That's good. But now how are you going to get your shell code for this case? So what they did was you make a JIT compiled function and get the address of it. To get the make JIT compiled functions pretty chill, you just create a function that does some junk. And then you just run it many, many, many times and then return the function. So it's nothing too crazy at all. And it doesn't have to be like a cool function because you're going to be overriding the shell code. So then you get the address of that function. And then using that address, you have to add 24 to it because of the way it's stored in memory to find the executable address. You add 24 to the executable address to get the JIT code object, and you add 368 for debug building 352 to get the JIT code address. I'm not gonna walk through all that in GDB or LLDB, but basically you could find that anywhere. I've seen so many different um, blogs about WebKit exploitation, and they just tell you how to walk through the JIT codes to find the actual JIT code, how to walk through the uh, function pointer to get the JIT code. So that's basically, you can find all that in LODB. You'd be like, okay, um, what is the function? How do you print that? Where is the pointer going to? And then just like follow the pointer or two to get there. So it's not too bad. And I'm running this on my debug build right now. So that's why I commented that one out. It's 368 plus set. So then here comes the cool part. You set up a variable that's a bunch of A's and get this address of it. And then you get the data and you push the address of the strings, which is found here onto your shell code at the end. And then you write your shell code to this address of your JIT code. And the shell code that um, he used for this uh, exploit is pretty simple. There's a file called slash flag, and he 
basically opens slash flag and then he writes the data from slash flag, no, reads it into a buffer that's stored at the end of your shell code. So by doing this, he's putting the value of the data at S, which is all the A's at the end of the shell code. I can walk through that part because it's pretty chill. And then printing S, you get the flag. So it's pretty chill. So I'll walk through that in LODB really quick. And if there's any steps that people want to see in particular, I can go back and set breakpoints and reads and stuff like that. Why did I do LLDB That was so dumb of me. I feel so dumb. Okay, let me go back and <laughs> fix that up a little. It's so slow. Okay, LLDB JSC. And then we're going to run pwn.js. And if I'm thinking right, I might have set the read point, but if I didn't, and it just finishes. Okay, I finished. It read the flag though, because I got the shell code to run. If I wanted to show the shell code, so I'm gonna set up a read line inside of here, so it'll pause and ask for input, and I can just break there. Oh no, my battery's low. Why did my battery get low? I was at 100 before I started this. Zoom is intense. Okay, so now all the way at the bottom here when we get to the part where it's about to run the shell code and copy it over. Okay, here it already pushed the shell code and it wrote it to the function. So here, it should already be here. So I'm gonna call a read line here and it'll wait for me to give it input. And I'm just not gonna give it input. I'm just gonna control C. Anyone who's done Python exploitation has probably done something similar using raw input or something like that. So it's very similar to that in like, why I would do that. I could also just set a random function and then break that function and then I'll call it there. But this works well for me usually. So running it, pwn.js, checks the primitives, JIT code, and then pauses because it's waiting for me to give input. So if I look at the JIT code here, it's this junk. But I don't want to see that junk. I want to see the actual instructions. So yeah, here's the shell code. And I'm gonna walk through the shell code by breaking here and continuing. So it's gonna move, push, move, 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 whatever syscall. So if you look at the registers here, oh, it's register re, isn't it? Yeah, okay. If you look at um, RDI, that's slash flag one. So that is what it's calling open on. And then the flags are zero, because that doesn't matter too much. So if we step one instruction, you can make sure it worked. Got assigned a valid file descriptor of three, so that's a good sign. You can step a little in, and then we'll see where it's trying to read it by looking at read register, or register read. But because of the fact that it moved RIP plus E into read, we know that it's gonna be somewhere after our shell code, and that's where we push the address of the function. So that's why we know that it's gonna, I know of the string. So we know that it's gonna be the data in the string. But to verify, we look at the data in RSI right now, it's a bunch of A's. So we know that we're writing to that buffer that had the A's that we stored. And if we step an instruction and then look, it has the flag there, but it's stored at the same location as all the A's. So then when we continue, it'll print the flag because of the fact that, if I cap this JavaScript exploit again, it was trying to, flag was set as s dot split by new line character. So it was printing s, and s was where it had all the a's. So we just overwrote that data manually with our shell code. The interesting thing about shell code in JavaScript is that um, you can still use JavaScript functions. By the time you hit shell code and you return, you're fine. So as long as you get it somewhere in memory, you can make it easier on yourself by just writing JavaScript functions. You could have also done something in your shell code where you like, chose to write it to the screen from that pointer, but we know where it is. We know that it's gonna be stored in S, so you might as well just use the JavaScript functionality to print that like this. So that's pretty interesting. So, um, yeah, what now? How do you like proceed from here? Um, I would pick a browser, anything that you think is interesting, and just start by building it. You download the source tree, building it. They all have really nice instructions and scripts to do that. Um, 
make objects in memory and see what they look like, see how the inlining works, how the properties and elements are stored. They don't all have butterflies. That's a WebKit specific thing. I think B8 does it a little differently. I want to say that Chakra Core and Spider Monkey both do it a little bit differently as well. Um, the best thing to do, in my opinion, and this is what I enjoy doing, is like find an old bug from like a CVE, for example, like maybe one from like 2016. So there's not a lot of like mitigations yet, and just revert to that git commit right before they fixed it, and then at that git commit, take their POC because anyone like who goes on Project Zero or whatever to publish a bug. Usually they'll put like a POC where like, oh, I wrote A's to this region or I made a fake object or something. And try to weaponize it. Try to take that simple bug and make an adder of and fake object. And then try to take those and do more stuff like that. Awesome. See you around, Gramps. Uh, if you ever have any questions about this stuff, you can always reach out to me too. Um, and then like when you get that patch there, like try to get those adder of and fake objects and turn it into reading and writing arbitrarily. Try to make a JIT function do shell code. Um, you can do a lot. Once you know where the bug is, the whole fr the thing is very fun to like make all the fake objects and stuff. Um, there's a lot of good CTF challenges for exploitation. WebKit has a couple of interesting ones. The one that I showed I thought was cool, but there's also one that was a uh, real world CTF finals that was very difficult. It had the gig page, it had the structure ID randomness, all that stuff. Um, and you can also just change the source tree yourself. Just like go in, change a function, change a property a little, and see if you can exploit that one little mistake you made through this whole field of all these objects and everything going on, and see like how important it is that the code's good in a database like this. So here's the resources. Here's a few interesting articles I read that helped me learn a lot. This is the Alive Overflow series. Um, this is the frac paper I read a lot of, but all of these are very good resources. And this is written by uh, QWERTY. He's the guy that also does the uh, jailbreaking that Grant was talking about last time. And um, there's also just any talks by like Silo, Itzen, Niklas B. Um, they all had a lot of very interesting stuff on Twitter and I learned a lot from them as well. So if you wanna learn more, you could definitely check out anything here and you'll learn a lot of stuff that's super useful information. It's a lot of fun in my opinion because it's a very cool target. No problem. Um, is there any questions? I'm definitely down to open questions or try to like demystify anything cool. Um, follow me on Twitch if you haven't already. I plan on streaming again eventually. Browser challenge when? Uh, Swamp CTF when? That's the question here. Um, browsers are a lot of fun, but um, I don't know yet. Uh, dude, we have coronavirus right now. Um, once we f figure out how that all is going to get fixed, it'll be a lot easier. But right now, coronavirus is intense. Do they have it in Texas? Is it in a uh, UT or does UT still have classes right now? It is Corona time. We should get Coronas for the coronavirus. Fight it with its own self. Okay, yeah, we're all online too right now. Um, I think UTA got closed too because I saw that UTA had it really bad early on but I'm kind of curious about that. Um, you can also have me on Discord too. I don't know why I put that there, so I'm gonna link, but yeah. Um, any questions? Cool, cool. Well, Owen, thank you for such a great talk. I will give you a... Such a great presentation, man. I appreciate thank you, it. thank you. Dude, it got so dark in here. I didn't realize how dark it was until I saw my face cam again. <laughs> yeah, all right. Dude, I'm going to stop did... recording now.